Father, we're so grateful for the move of your spirit already in this place. Lord, we would ask that you would continue that move by speaking. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher of the church. We didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, either color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord. We'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, tonight, we'll do our part. We'll give you our interest, our attention. Uh, we'll commit ourselves to understand those things which are being spoken. Lord, what, that which we perceive that you're speaking to our hearts, God. And Lord, you do your part. Illuminate our lives, Lord. Give us the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are having midweek services tonight, God. We bless them as they gather. May your spirit be amongst them as it is amongst us tonight. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Also, Lord, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. We ask that you bless them, watch over them, protect them, strengthen them, encourage them. Lord, we pray, God, that you would deliver them with a great and mighty deliverance. Father, may they endure to the end to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. Tonight, get your Bibles out and go with me to Romans, the 11th chapter. In fact, if you find Romans chapter 12, just back up a couple verses. We're going to be in Romans, the 11th chapter. A, a couple years ago, Pastor Deborah came back from a trip to Israel uh, and preached a brilliant message about how the church... Uh, really should be praying for and how we are to encourage Jewish believers. Uh, recently, Pastor Luke and Stacy came back from Israel as well, and Pastor Luke preached a brilliant message as well out of uh, these section of verses about the, the grafting of the olive branches. I mean, just wonderful imagery from the Word of God. And, and I would encourage you to go on to our message archives and take a look at those verses and, and, and just get a hold of that because that is a powerful understanding. And these are some, some difficult verses. Now, in these verses, Romans, the 11th chapter, there, there's this, this kind of section at the end that I want to focus in on tonight. Tonight, I want to talk to you about a subject called the God Conclusion. The God Conclusion. Romans, the 11th chapter, starts out the Apostle Paul talking about the Jewish nation. He starts talking about grafting. He starts talking about the Gentiles and how we are grafted in. These are huge concepts. These are things that, if you just gave them a quick read, you actually could kind of come to some conclusions that, that may not be where God is really speaking. You might get a little confused along the way, but finally you would realize some things through, through other scriptures and what the Spirit of God speaks to your heart and your life. Now, at the end of all those verses about the nation of Israel and about the Gentile church and the times that we're living in, the apostle brings them to a conclusion. And I believe that the conclusion that he brings is the God conclusion. And for each and every one of us, we in our own lives have to come to this same conclusion. Romans the 11th chapter, starting in verse number 33, reading through verse number 36, says this. Chapter 11, verse 33 starts out. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Listen to the language here. He's just got done talking about something that could hurt your brain if you thought about it a lot, right? And all of a sudden he stops and he has to just get his praise on. He has to stop and he has to say, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. He goes on to say this. And he says, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He says in some translations, they're untraceable. You know, the Bible says that the way of the Lord is in the deep. It's like walking through water. You cannot find the footsteps after a while. You can't trace them back to where they were. You cannot track them to figure everything out. You know, the Bible also tells us that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, that in these finite minds, in these natural fleshly earth suits and in the limitations that we have on our life, that we cannot understand the fullness of everything that God has done from the beginning, yet God has still placed eternity in our hearts. Verse number 34 comes along and says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? That's a pretty good question, don't you think? When did God ever say, hey, you know what, I don't really know what I want to do. Let me go find out what so-and-so has to say. You know, I was thinking about biology and the systems that I'm about ready to, to, to put into 
play here on the earth, and I think I need to get some, some, some insight from somebody who studied this more than I have. See, God is the one who created everything. God is the Almighty. He, he's, he's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He, he, he has the omnipresence, right? He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all at once. He's in all. He's through all. He knows all. And he's all-powerful. And therefore, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has offered him any counsel? The next verse comes along and says this, or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him. Did anybody ever lend God something God said, I owe you? No, why? Because God's the one that gave it to you in the first place. King David, when he brought an extravagant offering, an offering that was just like mind-blowing, that we all would have said, wow, he really gave a lot to God. What did he say to God? He said, God, of your own, we've given you back. It was all yours anyway. It all started with you. We collected it here on the earth, and now we're just giving you back what you already gave to us. So you cannot outgive God. And you can't come up with something that didn't originate with God to give to God that God should have to repay you. It goes on in verse number 36, and this is where I want to get to tonight. This is the God conclusion. After he, he goes through this whole discourse, after all this mind-numbing stuff about the plan of God of the age, about the church, and about how the, the, the Jews are, 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 are outside for a moment so that the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles can come in, and, and that there's jealousy and all this kind of stuff that's going to be going on to bring them back into the kingdom. He can graft them back in. After all this stuff that's kind of hard to figure out, this is the conclusion that he comes to. After he says his ways are past finding out, God is all wise. He, no one's offered him counsel. He's done this from the, from the beginning. Eternity, he had this plan in mind. This is the conclusion. He says, for of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. You ever opened up an email that just blew your mind? You just thought, that's ridiculous. It's changed your life. You ever flipped on the TV in the morning and heard the news and it just ruined your entire week? You ever seen something or heard something from somebody and it just so impacted you that you felt sick to your stomach? See, in all of our lives, I think we've encountered things that have troubled us. We, we've seen things on the earth that we've said that, that shouldn't be. We've been troubled by things on the planet. We've seen injustice. I remember watching the news with, with the, the refugees and there was a little five-year-old boy sitting on a seat wiping blood from his head and it wrecked me. It's it still to this day... That image pops into my mind and I can't help but be grieved. There, there's images, there's things. I remember uh, one time I was out in the middle of a field in the middle of Illinois. I was on a training camp. We were in the middle of a cornfield training to go overseas for missions. And there was one of our team members that was battling bulimia and anorexia. And I remember when they told our team she, she's battling this and she's struggling with this and she's going to go home so that she can work on this. She, she's not healthy enough to go with us on the team overseas. She's going to go and get under care of her pastors and her family and of a physician. I remember being sick to my stomach. I remember I had to take a walk that day, a long walk. And I had to deal with God and say, God, what's going on? This, this girl loves you. God, what, what's happening? Why is she struggling this way? God, why can't she go with us? I mean, this, this would have been amazing. She, she has a heart for people, and yet why does she have to struggle? Why don't you just deliver her, God? There's things in our lives that are going to impact us. Things in our life that are going to be hard to figure out. Things in our life that we're not really going to understand. But if we can take six little words that are one syllable each and apply them to our life and to our understanding, it will change the world that we live in. You want to know what those six little words are? Of him, to him, through him. That's it. Six little words that will change your life. Really, this is a summation of the difficult times in our lives. The hard-to-understand passages we go through in life can be traced here as well. See, we may not be able to trace what God is doing. We may not be able to figure out his ways. But if we, we can remember of him, through him, and to him, it will change the very world that we live in. Is anybody listening tonight? Let's start with the first two. Of him. Of him. See, God is the source of all things. We already talked about he is the creator. He is the almighty. He was the ultimate planner. God had eternity past to plan out everything that would happen in time here on the earth. 
That means that God is the one, the Bible tells us, that can declare the end from the beginning. Why? Because it was already in his heart. He already saw it. He already knew that it was going to take place. And many times we say, well, why if God knew everything that was going to happen, did he allow it? Why would God allow evil? Why would God allow suffering? Why would God allow pain? But we have to remember that there was a plan of God from eternity past, that it started with God. And that God who declares the end from the beginning is the one who planned all of this. God is the originator. God is the creator. God is the author. He is the alpha. He is the beginning. Therefore, if we can look to God and we can say, this is of God, my life. My very being began with God. Did you know that God formed you in your mother's womb? Literally, the Bible says that he knit you. He, he took all of your bones and the sinews and the muscles and the tissues and, and the flesh and everything, the hair. He, he, he fashioned you. It's a very intimate process. Much like when he created Adam and Eve, you know, he didn't just speak a word. I believe that God lay down, started to trace in the ground, started to form and to fashion as he put Adam to sleep, he drew from his side the woman, and he formed the woman. And these weren't just good. These were very good. See, God is good. Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. See, when you start to look to God, when you start to see that God is the author, when you start to see God as creator, when you start to see that God had plans for this day, for this hour, when you recognize and you realize that even in adversity, that God knew you were going to be at this place at this time, when you start to take a look at that and you realize that God is your source, it starts to make everything come together. Remember the very first words in the Bible? Can anybody quote Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 with me? In the beginning, God. Right? We could stop right there. Because if you get your perspective on the problem, if you get your perspective on the source of pain rather than the source of life, then you're going to have the wrong perspective. You're going to focus on that pain. You're going to focus on that problem. You're going to focus on that trial. And yet God doesn't want you focused on pain, problems, and trials. God wants you to focus on, in the beginning, God. The very first place we should go to is God. The very author, the very beginning, the alpha. He is the one who is the highest. He is the one who is the greatest. He's the one that we should run to. He's the one He should be our source. He is our all in all. He is God. Change your life. Change your life. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Turn there with me. You're there in Romans. Turn back. Past Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. You'll find Colossians. Chapter number 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16 and verse number 17. says this. Speaking of Jesus, it says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and Invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. See, guys, this life is not about politics or money or wealth or fame or entertainment or education. This life is about Jesus. Because why? In the beginning, God. He's first. He's the priority. He is number one. And therefore, when we get that perspective and we realize in him and by him were all things created, visible or invisible. See, we've got to get this perspective past the natural and past the now. There are things beyond our sight that we need to recognize that God is in and that he's in control of. Why? Because it started with him. And if he's the creator of it, then he is greater than it. We say that again. If God is the creator of it, then he is greater than it. Look at Colossians 1, verse 16 again. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Where do we live here and now? Earth, right? So all things that are on earth were created by him. Somehow we get the picture. 
That God is not in control here on the earth. Yes, heaven, everything is great in heaven, and Lord, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So God, apparently you're in control in heaven, but you're not in control here on the earth. And we get the wrong picture. Why? Because we've got to remember in the beginning, God. All things that are on earth, look at visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions. Had recently a lot of people that were all worried about who was going to get elected into the highest office in our land. Can I tell you something? I don't care who is in office. I don't care what party's in power. There were people rejoicing in the streets over somebody that just died in another nation that was in power for a long time. Guess what, you guys? The gospel has never been chained. Jesus has never been stopped. Jesus never was biting his teeth, taking a Prozac because somebody got into office or because there was a dictator in a country. Jesus is in control. All things were created by him. Those thrones, he's the one that set them up. And if he wants to take them down, he most certainly can. It's all in his power to do so. Why? Because it's created by him. But God didn't only start the process. He's not only the source, but he's also the one who carries it through. The next two little words that can change your life is this, through him. Through him. See, not only is God the source, but he is also the sustainer. He is also the stimulus. He is also the supplier. See, sometimes we look at our life and we say, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Here's how you're going to make it, through him. Pastor, I don't know if I can take it. Here's how you're going to take it, through him. I don't know if I have the strength. Here's how you're going to get the strength, through him. I don't have the resources I need. I need more cash. I need more money. I need more time. I need more friends. I need more, I need more, 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 more. I don't have what I need. Here's how you're going to get what you need through him. See, when you live your life through him, again, it changes the world that you live in. Because if you're living through your own effort and your own strength, you'll only go as far as you're able. If you're living through your own resource, when your resource runs out, that's where you stop. But when you're living in the resource of an unlimited God, there is no limitations on your life. There is only the power of God that's available to you. But you got to live through him. See, if you don't have the wisdom and the knowledge base that you need to continue to do what you need to do in life, I don't know how to be a good husband. I don't know how to be a wife. I don't know how to be a parent. I, I, I don't know how to live for Jesus out there. I don't know how to be a witness. I, I don't know how to be a boss. I don't know how to be an employee. I, I don't know how to be retired. This is new to me. I don't know how to be a grandparent. Oh my goodness, I don't know any of this stuff. Here's how you're gonna know. You have the unlimited wisdom and knowledge of God. Oh, the depths of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. He said, but pastor, okay, I get that, I understand that, but how do I get a hold of that? See, if you get your eyes off Jesus, you'll tend to falter, and you'll look to the wrong things for your sustenance. In other words, we'll start looking to Barnes and Noble to find out how to parent our children. Let me go and see what the experts have to say. Let me go find Dr. Phil's latest book, or let me watch Oprah and see what she has to say. Listen, they're wonderful. They may have some great suggestions, but they are not Jesus. They are not your sustainer. They are not the ones who have the words of life. See, if we're to receive anything, 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 it's got to be through him. Not through the world, not through wealth, not through the natural, not through the now. No, it has to be through the eternal power of the living God. Your salvation cannot be of yourself. It has to be through him. Come on, somebody say it with me. It has to be through him. Your provision cannot be of yourself. It can't be of your boss. It cannot be of your job. It cannot be of the government of the United States of America. It has to be through him. Your healing cannot be just based on a doctor's opinion. It cannot be based on a pill. It cannot be based on a diet or an exercise plan, even, those are, even though those are good things for your life. It has to be through him. Your blessings. Sometimes we're looking for blessings in people. We're looking for blessings in the world. We're looking for the blessing of the season. It's Christmas time. And we're looking for the blessings of Easter. We're looking for the blessings of this world or an experience or a vacation. But listen, it cannot be through anything except through him. Everything in life has to be through him. My goodness, the only way to find what God is up to is through him, through Jesus Christ. He's left us his spirit. Back to 1 Corinthians. Turn there with me. 1 Corinthians. Turn back. 1 Corinthians. Chapter number 2. Starts talking about eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for us, but by his spirit... He's revealed them to us. 
Look at verse number 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Here we are, that same quote out of the Old Testament. But look at what it says. But we have the mind of Christ. In other words, eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things which the Lord has prepared for us, but we have his spirit. In the natural, you cannot understand the will and the way of the Lord. You do not have the resources or the mental faculties. But the Bible tells us in this book, and I would encourage you, if you want to look more into this, read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 right there in the beginning and find out what it has to say because God has given us of his spirit. And who knows the inside of what's going on inside a man's heart except the soul or the spirit of a man, right? In the same way, who knows what's going on inside of God except the spirit of God? Therefore, if God has given us his spirit to live on the inside of us, and we have a relationship with the living God, then we never need be confused in life again. Why? Because it's of him, but guess what else? Life is lived through him. And therefore, the spirit of God will reveal to each and every one of us in this room that are willing to seek, to stop, to listen for the voice of the spirit, and say, God, what's up with that? Jesus, tell me about what's happening on the earth right now. Show me what's happening with the world situation. I'm confused about what's going on. God, why the injustice? And the Spirit of God will speak words of counsel. He'll speak words of wisdom. He'll speak words of knowledge. He will deliver to you what the heart and the, the mind of God is in each and every situation. You may not get the answer you wanted. Oh, come on. You, you might not be able to explain everything, but sometimes you will get the peace that passes all understanding. Sometimes you'll get the heart of God in the situation. Sometimes you'll feel the, the character of God coming through you. You'll, you'll start to weep and mourn over the things, and you'll see things like God sees them. Your heart will break over the things that his heart breaks for. You'll start to know things by the spirit that this is of the Lord. It started in him, and guess what? It's going through him right now. God is speaking to my life. Just to drive this home, look at verse number 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. You know that God has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness? All things, not some things. All things. When you don't know how, he knows how, and he's given it to you. All things. When you can't, he can. He's given you every resource you need. All things. There is no lack, no desire, no want if you will press into the Spirit of God. Get a hold of his understanding, his wisdom. He'll speak it to you. See, we can't instruct God, but he can instruct us. He can teach us a thing or two about a thing or two. God doesn't want us in the dark. He wants us to know what we have available to us through him. God does not want you to be a weak, broke down, busted and disgusted Christian, just kind of living your life, bumping from whatever way the lazy river of life flows you, okay, sarah, sarah, whatever happens, happens, I guess that's just how it is, whatever it is will be, right? It is what it is. No, it is not what it is. You can change what it is with the spirit and the grace of God and the wisdom of God as you live life through him, through him. No other way except through him. Last one is this to him. These words, if you get a hold of these words, of him, through him, to him, it'll change your life because not only is God the source, not only is God the supply, but when you start living life to him, see it all begins and it ends with Jesus. Now all of a sudden it brings life into the place of significance. We're all looking to leave a mark here on the earth. I don't care who you are. When we die, we want somebody to miss us. When we go, we want someone to say, their life changed my life. It meant something. And even beyond that, if we get a right perspective of living life for God, living unto the Father, then when our life ends here on the earth, even though none of the great people of the earth may notice that we were ever here, and in a hundred years they won't even remember our names, as long as we go before the Father, and as long as we get into the presence of Almighty God, and we get entrance to the throne. And as we stand before that throne, 
That if God would say, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. That is what counts for all eternity because it's not about what things I have here on the earth. It's about what's significant to the Father that really matters. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 7, you can look it up on your own time, talks about how the waters start in the springs, they start in the highlands, start as rains, and they come down as rivers, and they go to the ocean, they return to the place where they began. Science has proven this to be true, right, through the process of evaporation and rains and all that kind of stuff. The waters continually renew on the earth. In the same way, our lives, everything that began with God will end with God. Of him, through him, and to him, guys, this is all going back to the heart of the Father. Jesus is not only Alpha, but he's also the Omega. He's not only the beginning, but he's also the last. He's not only the author, but he's also the finisher of our faith. He is the one that we are headed towards. He is our aim. He is our victory. He is our goal. He is the one that will receive us into eternal dwellings. He is everything. He's the one that our life is all about, and it is Jesus that we are headed towards and therefore when you live your life towards Jesus you live a life of significance come on somebody it all goes back to him you're not always going to be able to see what God's up to spirit of God sometimes will not tell you things because he's growing you up or because he's leading you not going to understand all the works of God from beginning to end until we've gone through the process. There may be some things that we have to wait till we go to heaven to find out about. God, why? I'll tell you why when you come to heaven. Right? We've all had those experiences. God, it's too soon. God, it's too late. God, I don't understand. God, why? When you come see me, you'll know. Right? We've all had those things. But there's other things that God says, says not now. Just keep going. Because when it starts with God, and then you go through it, then looking back on it, you'll say, you know what, the road that I walked, God was with me every step of the way, even though I thought he wasn't there. When you've been through the fire and didn't get touched by the flame, you'll be able to say, God, I know that you were holding me, you were sustaining me, and I was only able to make it through you. When the waters have risen against you and the devil's thrown all hell has broken loose against you, the bust of the dam, and it's all coming at you, and you're still standing when everything's done with the shouting, listen, you will be able to say, God, I know you were there. God, I can see what you were up to. In John chapter 13, verse 7, Jesus is speaking to Peter, and Peter has a real problem with Jesus washing his feet, like many of us would too. Jesus, you don't want to get around those nasty things. I haven't had my Manny Petty in a while, and um, no, right? And so Peter is fighting with Jesus. Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't do this, you're not clean. Well, then give me a whole bath. Jesus, Jesus said, no, nah, Peter, you're going overboard, man. You don't need the whole thing, just, just the feet right now, okay? And listen to what Jesus says, and I think this is applicable for all of us. Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. See, there are things that we will go through in life that as you press into the Spirit of God, you know it's of Him, and you know you're going to go through it through Him, but it isn't until you get to Him that you'll really understand what God is up to. He says, you may not understand right now. You, You got the pink slip, and you may not understand why you lost your job right now, but when you get to the next job, you'll know why I did this. You you may not understand why Jesus told you to move and pack up everything and get to the next destination, but when you get there, when you make it to the place that I've called you, then you'll understand. You may not know really what's happening in your life right now, why God is working. Why would God bring this issue up now? What is God doing? And yet, when you get through the issue on the other side, then Jesus says, when you get there, you'll understand. It's amazing what perspective does. When we look back down the road, that's why the, the common phrase is what? Hindsight is twenty twenty. Because oh, now I get it. Now I see. Look at what this has produced in my life. Some things we have to endure so that we'll understand what God is doing behind the scenes. 
James chapter 5, verse number 7 and verse number 8 says this. Right after Hebrews, you'll find the book of James. James chapter number 5, verse number 7. And verse number 8. James says this. Therefore, be patient. Don't you just hate that? I mean, like, can we just rip that out of the Bible? No one wants to be patient, especially not in our world of instant everything, right? Man, my six-year-old made oatmeal for himself this morning. Like, what on earth? The kid can make oatmeal. It's instant. You rip open a package, you pour water in, you put it in the microwave, you push a button, it's done. Glory to God. <laughs> we want everything now. I want it right. I want it right now. I, I, I don't want to wait. But God says, be patient. Oh, Lord, why? Because he's taking you through something. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. There's a season and a time. There's the early rain. We all love that, right? Ooh, yeah, rain. It's good. Early rains. Woo, right? Gonna have a great crop this year. And then there's silence. And we start to wonder, are we going to get the latter rains? Uh, are we going to get what we need? I'm running out of resource, God. Are you going to provide? God, I, I've come to the end of my knowledge base. Lord, are you going you to drop some wisdom on me? I, I don't really have the strength to take me through to the finish line, God. Are you going to show up with what I need? I need some strength. I need some energy. I need some vitality. And yet, it says, look to the farmer. See, in, in our society, we go to the grocery store. And you got fruits and vegetables from the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So you never have to wonder whether or not there's going to be grapes there because they're not in season. Because they're always in season somewhere on the earth, right? And yet we don't understand patience like a farmer understands patience. We don't understand waiting until the fruit is ripe to pick it because we can just go and get ripe fruit anytime we want to. We've conditioned ourselves in a way that the word of God now seems weird to us. And yet he says, you're not only a soldier in the army of the Lord and going and taking ground and being aggressive and fighting the good fight of faith. You're not only an athlete running your race, but guess what else you are? You are a farmer. You're going to have to sow seed, and there is seed, time, and harvest. The seed does not immediately produce. You've got to wait Patiently for the early rains. And the latter rains. And then when the harvest is ripe, that's when you put in the sickle. Verse 8. You also be patient. Two times and two verses. Do you think God is saying something to us when he starts repeating himself? In other words, you didn't get it the first time because you didn't like it. But now that I got your attention, now that I've been talking to you about farmers and you're dreaming about the little red barn and the, and the old McDonald's song, now I got you. You also be patient. Look at what he says. Establish your hearts. Set them in stone. Set them to trust the Lord, that he is good, that he, he is the beginning. He's the one that started. You're going to make it. How am I going to make it? You're going to make it through him. And guess what? It all goes back to him. Establish your hearts. Look at what it says. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Jesus is coming back. He is the beginning and the end. He is the one that it all goes back to. What do I do when I don't understand? Here's what you do. You let God's glory be the conclusion. The God conclusion that the Apostle Paul, of him, through him, and to him, are all things concluded with, to God be all glory and praise. In other words, it doesn't matter what happens here on the earth. It doesn't matter if I don't understand the whole process, if I don't get the whole seed, if I don't have all the answers, if, if all the pieces of the puzzle aren't fitting together right now. All I can conclude is that God is good and that God is to be praised no matter what happens to me here on the earth, no matter what happens around me, no matter what's going on from him, through him, to him are all things and to God be the glory turn your complaints oh come on somebody because we've been complaining 
And that's why people don't want to be Christians. Because they heard us complaining, right? Complain about everything. Oh my goodness, people stopped following you on Facebook during the elections. Why? Because we were complaining. Rather than praising. Rather than trust. Turn your complaints into cries of praise. And turn your arguments into adoration. Start to lift up a cry and a shout to the Lord in a voice of triumph. Not triumph. Triumph, somebody. Come on. you got to start praising Jesus when you don't understand. Oh, let me show you a verse, because some of you guys don't got it yet. Psalm 145, verse number 10. All your works shall praise you. Everything you created will praise you. Everything you started will praise you. Everything you're sustaining right now by the power of your word will praise you praise you. The rocks are going to cry out. The trees are going to cry out. The skies are screaming his praise. The oceans will roar. The thunders will proclaim. But listen, the church of God, God formed you in your mother's wombs, and you're going to praise him. You're going to lift up a cry. You're going to lift up a shout. Look at what it says. And all your saints shall bless you. Somebody better bless his name. Hallelujah. Come on. So when you open up that email tomorrow and your world crumbles, when you flip on the news and everything's gone to hell in a handbasket, somebody in the cosmos flushed the toilet and everything's going down in a big circle, right? When the proverbial stuff hits the proverbial fan, (laughs) hello, what do you do? You start to praise him. You start to lift up a cry, lift up a shout. You put a smile on your face. You get a little Holy Ghost jig going on, right? You start to dance. You start to sing. You start to shout. Why? Because of him and through him and to him are all things to God be the glory and praise. Come on, somebody. Let's give a great big cry and a great big shout of praise. Hallelujah. Tonight, I wonder if there's those of you, as we were singing that song, that said, you know what, I haven't yet really laid down my life and given it to Jesus. You know, any time the church gathers, you know, sometimes we preachers can be a little foolish. We can think that just because people showed up to church, that means they're right with God. But did you know that nothing can be further from the truth? Because the Bible tells us that there is a mixture in the kingdom, that there's both wheat and tares, and that they grow up together. In fact, the Apostle Paul warned of people in church and said, Savage wolves will rise up from among you, not sparing the flock. And there's people, even in this room tonight, that if you were to die right now, that you would not go to heaven. That you would go to hell. And I don't care if you're offended by that. You know, our society tries to to water the, the message of the gospel down. They try and say, well, you know what, there is no hell. But listen, the Old and the New Testament talk about it. Jesus himself spoke of it. It's a very real place, and you're not going to avoid it just by denying its existence. And I want you to just take a moment right now, and you know tonight as you came into this place, you know tonight that as you heard that song, that something was tugging at your heart. I would suggest to you tonight that you recognize and realize it's the leading of God. The Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart and saying, tonight is your night of salvation. Now listen, you do not get saved by being good. Sometimes we get this wrong idea that if I just can be good enough, that I can work my way into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to get to heaven. You say, well, you know what? I've been really bad, and therefore i got to clean up my act so I can become good enough to get in. Well, listen, you can't be bad enough to keep you out either. Jesus' blood was shed for each and every one of us, for all of our sins, past, present, and future. You don't clean up your act and come to Jesus. No, you come to Jesus and he'll clean up your act. That's what this is all about. Forgiveness was offered with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes people think, well, you know, I was raised in church. I'm fine. It's okay, preacher. You don't have to worry about me. No, listen. No one in the Bible doesn't say your parents raised you in church tell you you're a Christian. That makes you a Christian. I don't care how many Sunday school classes, Sabbath school classes, catechism classes. I don't care if you were baptized or christened as a child, if you wore a t-shirt in your teen years that said Jesus, or you got a tattoo with a scripture verse on it. I don't care that you're born in America. America is not a Christian nation. That everybody born in America automatically goes to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion that that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. 
You might have volunteered at your last church. You might have sang in the choir, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of you as a leader. Might have even got a membership card to a church. But guess what? None of that qualifies you for heaven. Sometimes people think, well, I, I know God and I, I, I know about the gospel. I know about the forgiveness of sins that's offered in the blood of Jesus. I could quote scriptures to you. That's great. I'm glad you can do this. But you know that that won't get you into heaven just because you know who God is. How do I know that? Because demons believe that Jesus Christ is in God. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is. And that doesn't get him right with God, even though he can quote scriptures out of his mouth. Look at me, church. Look at me. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about mental ascent towards God knowing who he is. And that makes you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, that doesn't mean what we've seen on movies and television, books, Hollywood, and the internet. Simply means this, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. And if you haven't yet done that, tonight if you were to die, you would die and you would end up in hell. You would not go to heaven because unless you're born again, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. And tonight, I'm going to have them sing that song again. And you know who you are in this place. You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. You need to be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Tonight is a night to change destinies. Tonight is a night to change course. And you already know that the Spirit of God has spoken to you. He's already touched you. And during that song, you felt like you wanted to run up here. Or maybe tonight, as you heard me speak, you identified, you know what? If I was to die, I wouldn't make it. As they sing this song once again, I want you to just come and line up right here in front because we're going to pray together to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again tonight, right here, right now. Don't wait another minute. If you need to get right with God, just come to this altar and line up right here in front. You come right now as they sing this song. Come on, let's sing that together. You come right now. Come on. come to the altar. They're coming. Come on, you can come too. Come on, right now. Right now. arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. I could stop right here because this is amazing. This is a move of the Spirit of God right here in front of all of us. But I believe there are those of you in this place that are stubborn. And you are resisting the Spirit of God that's on you right now. You, you feel that nervousness inside. Maybe you're even shaking. God's calling you out right now. This is not a time to resist. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. We've had people from prison write this church and say, I was in your church. I heard the altar call. I passed up the opportunity. And I got in a gunfight with the police that night. Ended up in jail. Ended up away from you guys at the church. Ended up away from the woman that I love. And now I'm spending time in prison. I wish that I could go back and change that moment. But I was stubborn and I passed up the opportunity. Tonight, do not pass up this opportunity. If you're stubborn and you're stiff-necked, come on, don't resist the Holy Spirit. Tonight is your night of salvation. They're gonna sing it again. I'm giving you another opportunity tonight and you come to this altar and give your heart and your life to Jesus wholeheartedly. Come on, run to this place tonight. Run to this altar. There's forgiveness. There's healing. There's life. You come right now. Come on. 
seat and saying that's okay for them. God's passed me up. God's done me wrong. God's left me. He's abandoned me. And I tell you something, you would be the only person that God ever gave up on. Be the only person that God ever abandoned. So the Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Tonight, you are not forgotten by God and you are not forsaken and the Lord loves you right now just feel the tenderness of the Holy Spirit drawing you one last time they're going to sing this and tonight if you know the Spirit of God is tenderly drawing you wooing you lovingly calling you home come to this altar Sing it one more time. Don't come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. Everybody up front, look up here. Thank God you came tonight. Thank God you're here. I'm going to lead you in that prayer. This is the wisest and best decision of your entire life right here, right now. Those of you that are joining us online, if you need to pray this prayer, I'm going to lead them in this prayer, but you're welcome to pray this with us and receive Jesus wherever you're at all over the world that, that are watching via the live stream. I'm going to pray a simple prayer, short phrases, okay? I want you to repeat them out loud if you have the ability, okay? Everybody in the room is going to join in with you, okay? Now, this is not about the words of your mouth. This is about the expression of your heart. You came to give God all of your heart, came to give God all of your life. Right now, you're going to be born again. Now, I don't know what God does to recreate his spirit. Somehow, he takes that old dead man and he recreates it and makes it brand new. There's a miracle that's going to take place in your life tonight, right now. Now listen, tomorrow you're going to wake up, you're going to look the same, smell the same, but you're brand new. You have a new life in Jesus Christ. Okay? So let's do this. Let's pray together. Let's all bow our heads. Let's all close our eyes. Everybody's going to join in with us. And I want you to say these words out loud if you have the ability. Put your heart on the Lord and say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came, 
that he died and he was raised again to life just for me. Forgive me my sin. Cleanse me of my past. Wash me with your blood and fill me with your spirit. And let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm saved. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big shout of praise that he's worthy of tonight. Woo! Man. All right, now all of you up front, you just gave your heart and life to Jesus. We don't want to leave you there wondering, what do I do next now that I'm a Christian? So we have some free stuff we want to give you. We want to connect you with someone here in the church we call a spiritual personal trainer. It's easy. It's free. You need to do it. It'll take you a couple minutes of your time, okay? So right over here, this is Pastor Joel, one of our pastors on staff here. He loves you guys. He's just going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. going to get that information to you, and then he'll let you come right back out in the church service, okay? Come on, let's give the Lord a praise tonight.